How many would rather be here than in ICU down at UT Hospital? Amen. Lord's been good to me. He's been real good to me. Amen. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter number 28, verse 19, verses 19, 20. There are some things that it took me years to uh, come to convictions about, and uh, this is one of them. What you have before you in Matthew chapter number 28, verses 19, 20, is commonly referred to as what? The Great Commission. Let's read it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. All right. That's, that's what is uh, said tonight, the classic scripture for the Great Commission. Okay? It's not the only one. Turn to Mark chapter number 16. Depending on what church you go to, what denomination you're belong with, what group you're affiliated with, will determine which one of these great commissions that you preach all the time. Now let's look at the great commission in Mark chapter number 16, verse 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now watch this. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. How many of you have any kind of a reference in the side column in your Bible that says that the last few verses of Mark chapter number 16 shouldn't even be in the Bible? How many of you got that? Any of you have a reference to that in your Bible? Cross-reference? Well, the scholars will tell you that the last few verses in Mark shouldn't even be there. They're what's called an interpolation. In other words, they've been added later to the text. And so it brings in question as to whether or not this is Scripture. See, we deal with this all the time. This is, this is a problem. This is why... I get up and open up the King James Bible and I tell you that's the Word of God. From Genesis through Revelation, all 66 books, that's God's Word. See? No missing verses, no added verses. It is verbatim what God gave us. I believe that. I've looked at the uh, evidence that they propose to give why Mark, uh, the last few verses in Mark 16 shouldn't be there and the evidence just isn't there. The overwhelming majority of manuscripts support Mark chapter number 16, the last few verses. I'll accept that. I believe I've got the Bible. But now why would they do that? Why would you go back 2,000 years ago or why would you go back a few hundred years, over a thousand years, and why would somebody want to remove the last few verses? You got that right. Doctrine. Uh, every time that you find a place in the New Testament that is controversial or brought into question, you'll find that uh, it, it, it has something to do with doctrine. And so therefore some scribe somewhere along the line didn't, didn't especially like the doctrine, and so he changed it. You see, the problem is that uh, they didn't have any typewriters, no computers, no way to electronically <clears throat> secure something, and so it had to be hand-copied. And so from generation to generation, it was hand-copied, hand-copied, hand-copied. And so the text that is it, uh, as it, uh, the transmission of the text is a study in itself. But what you have in your hands right there is an English Bible that came from the vast majority of all of the text available. That's why it's called the majority text, the received text. And it's in Mark 16 is in there. Now let's look at the text itself. What's the big difference between Mark chapter number 16 and Matthew chapter number 28 verses 19 and 20? There is a difference. There's an awful lot of difference. 
The commission to go forth and preach and teach is the same. There's no difference there. But it talks about signs that accompany them that believe. And it talks about things that uh, are part of the preaching of the Word of God. Now, remember, as I've told you time and again, the standard teaching in most, I'd say most Baptist uh, colleges, is that the apostolic church had signs and miracles and wonders accompanying the gospel, but that all faded out. And that it faded out and it's gone. And now that, uh, that today, 2010, uh, essentially here and there you may see God do something. But essentially it's the preaching of the gospel because you've got the completed canon of Scripture. And that's just the way the Holy Spirit intended for it to be. Here's the problem. They can't produce one verse of Scripture. Not one. Not one. To support that theory. That's a theory. All right. How many of you in here in this house tonight need prayer answered I do believe me I do I do I need prayer answered in fact is there are many things I'm praying about right now I need answers to prayer okay I don't want some preacher to get up my face and tell me that that uh, you know I'm really wasting my time uh, that all that passed off in the apostolic age and and if I've got a sick loved one, well, I just have to suck it up and, and, and you know, accept, accept it the way it is. No, I don't have to do that. He doesn't have any scripture for that. As a matter of fact, there's an overwhelming majority of scripture for just the other thing. There's every reason for you to believe tonight that God hears and answers prayer. In James chapter number 5, I want you to look at this text. James was written later on in the ministry, later on in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, chronology in the time. James chapter number 5. Uh, James chapter number 5. And this is one of the reasons that I anoint with oil. Is simply to be, uh, is, to, is, to, is to identify with the text. Is to agree with the text. You don't have to be anointed with oil to be healed. No, you don't. Don't let anybody tell you that now. You don't have to. But if you know to do something... If you know something needs to be done, if you have been given light on something, if God has spoken to your heart about something, then don't turn that away. And since I know it's in the Bible, I'm going to follow what the Bible says. Now notice what it says in here in James chapter number 5 verse 14. It says, Are there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now watch this. Here's a promise. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now watch what follows. This is hard. It's not easy. If somebody believes that the Bible is a book written to make you feel good, you got the wrong Bible. Sometimes when I read the Bible, I don't feel good. <laughs> I said, oh, me. Confess your faults one to another. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all tonight. Only certain things I'm going to tell you. Nothing personal. <laughs> I am not about to reveal my whole life to you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm not about to do it. But there's a difference between a proclivity, which is a fault, and a sin, which is something you've done. All right? Confess your faults one to another and pray. Watch this. One for another that you may be healed. See that? Now watch this. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know what? That, I, I have never bothered to really look that Greek word up. I'm not big on Greek. You know, I, I can read Greek. Had three years of it and all that. But I believe the English Bible. But I can handle it if I need to. So I thought, well, what is that word there, effectual, fervent? Found out it's only one word. And I was amazed when I found out what word it was. It's a word that's used every day in the English language. It's the root word for energy. The Greek word is energeo. I looked at that and I thought, good night, son. That's energy. There's so many Greek words, folks, that came straight into English. They didn't, they didn't go around through Latin. They didn't come back. They came straight into English. And this is one of them. Energy. And what's energy? That's really putting something into us, isn't it? And two English words are used to translate one Greek word. 
The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. In plain words, this is somebody who really gets with it when it comes to praying. No monotone, no, you know, no, no standard classical church prayer, but somebody who may even open up their heart and pour some tears out and crawl under a log somewhere and stay there all night if they have to to get a hold of God. That's what it's talking about. And he says the effectual fervent prayer of a man like that avails much. It avails much. Notice how God can be moved by certain types of prayer and certain types of attitude and certain types of hearts. He can be moved. Notice the effectual fervent prayer avails much. Is that a conditional statement? Yes, it's conditional. It's conditional on how fervent and effectual the individual is. How much energy they put into it, in other words. How much of their soul they pour out in it. How much of themselves they put into the prayer. Now, God never requires you to do something that He does not first provide you with the necessary means to do it. He never. He never expects you in the flesh to be able to please God. You can't do it. Forget it. You're not going to do it. Therefore, you must be able to avail yourself of spiritual resources. You've got to. Now, when God saved you, He put the Holy Ghost in you. When the Holy Ghost moved in, you had the personality of a person move in. From that moment on, you began to get uh, introduced to that person. And you found out after it hadn't been saved long, you found out, this person's got feelings. <laughs> He's quiet now. What did I do to quieten him? What is it about my life that he's not pleased with? So from day one, you begin to understand that the Christian is living in a different world than the unsaved man. He's living in connection with the Holy Ghost that dwells within him. He learns to discern the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God de deals with you individually. Now, my friend, when you're coming to the issue of prayer, it's not prayer in the flesh. This is not the effectual, fervent prayer of the flesh. This is the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. This is prayer in the Spirit. The fact of the matter is, the only way you can really pray is in the Spirit. And the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. He prays according to Romans chapter number 8. This prayer in the Spirit is something that has to do with our communion and fellowship with God. You notice that most preaching is external? How many of you noticed that? How many of you observed that? Most preaching is from the outside, working from you on you from the outside, when your problem is not what's on the outside, your problem is what's on the inside. Amen. And the only way to make a change on the inside is by the Spirit of the living God. And you cannot take a piece of paper and lay it down somewhere and put a bunch of things down there and follow that and expect that to be what you use to understand the moving and the presence of God. You just have to know Him. You've got to know Him. You've got to know who's in you. And you've got to know what it means to when, you, when, you, uh, when, you, when, you, when you grieve Him, cleanse Him. Now I want you to look at another scripture in verse number uh, 15 of chapter 4 of the book of Hebrews. Chapter number 4, verse 15. Hebrews 4, 15. Hebrews 4, 15. I want you to look carefully at this scripture. I'm going to pull another Greek word on you tonight. We're going to give you some Greek. Amen. I've been to Greece, been to the Parthenon, been to the Acropolis, been to Mars Hill, to the Agora, and all the rest that Greek has. A lot of good things to see over there. It's quite a remarkable thing. The fact is, you know you're stepping back in history and you're seeing all these things. But Greece represents culture, okay? It represents culture. So the Greek language was the language of, of, uh, of, of, of commerce, culture. You know, if you could speak Greek, you could go about anywhere and you could communicate in the Greek language. In other words, an Arab could, could communicate with a, with a European through Greek. You could do that, the Greek language. That gave them a common language. It's like, it's like this. In the, in the, I've read a little bit about uh, Indians. They call them Native Americans, if you want to be politically correct. I grew up calling them Indians. That's what they called them. That's what Columbus called them. But anyway, they had a common language among themselves. Do you realize that? The dialects of the Indian language ran into the thousands, 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 and thousands. There's no one Indian in any way that could communicate with all the Indians. He didn't know the languages. He couldn't communicate. But they had a common language, sign language. The sign language allowed them to communicate 
And that's an amazing thing because even though they couldn't communicate verbally through their own tongue, natural tongue, they could communicate with a sign language. Now, where'd the tongue start from? Where'd all these languages start? I mean, when the tadpole crawled up out of the water and hung itself in a tree somewhere, you know, and first learned to talk and little tadpoles were born. No, it was at the Tower of Babel, right? That's right. God confounded the languages. And just add this to that while I'm thinking about languages. The language is the one thing that unites people. And it, if you don't speak the same language, you become a foreigner. Even though you live in the same country, if you're not speaking the same language, you're a foreigner. How many of you agree with that? I'm not trying to, to cast anything on anybody tonight. I'm trying to make a point. You're a foreigner because you don't speak the same language, all right? You're different. You, you, you may not be a fine person, but you're different. You speak a different language, all right? So the world here in the United States, we speak, we speak the King's English, although we have Italians and Frenchmen and Germans and, and uh, Africans and everything else in the sun that's made up this country and brought their native tongue with them. It became English, became the language of the land, all right? So they could communicate. When you got saved by the grace of God, when God saved you, He put a language within you. He gave you words that mean something to every born-again believer on the face of the earth. And when you mark it down, put this down in your book somewhere. When the things that are precious to you as a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the things that the Holy Ghost has burned into your heart, if they don't mean anything to that religious person you're talking to, that religious person you're talking to does not know the Lord. I don't care if they've got robes hanging all over them. I don't care if they've got big chapels and big steeples. They don't know the Lord because they don't know the language. The language is very important. There's nothing holy about the Greek language. It's just the language of the day. To be specific, it's Koine Greek. It's the common language of their day. But notice here in Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Now remember what James said. He said that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man a prayer that originates from within that has power to it. It has soul in it. It has tears attached to it. Even so much as when the Lord prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, great drops of blood came forth from Him. You know what would be a good study? Pull up Google sometime or some other search engine on the Internet and see if you can find where anybody else sweated blood in prayer. That's quite a remarkable thing. You say, well, could something like that really happen? Friend, if the Bible says his sweat became blood, that's what it meant. Blood. You could tell where he was praying. All you had to do was look at the rock and it had blood on it. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Did God the Father hear the Son? When he stood at the tomb of Lazarus, what did he say? I know, but what did he say before he said, Lazarus, come forth? What did he say? He said, I know you hear me. All right? That's the issue. It's not what God's going to do. It's to know that He heard you. Are you following me? The issue is to know He heard you. You know that He heard you. Your words don't fall to the ground. What did He say about Samuel? He said, He let none of His words fall to the ground. Empty, dead, religious rhetoric. How many of you have heard what I'm talking about? We'll pray for you and then forget it immediately and walk out the door. Right? If your, if, your, if your Christian life is not real enough, that when you tell somebody you're going to pray for them and you don't pray for them, what are you, what are you, doing? What are you playing? Huh? Are we playing Baptist religion? What are we playing? East Tennessee religion? I mean, what are we playing? It's a game. Because if you really have no soul, for those about you, there can be no effectual fervent prayer. Remember Mark 16, these signs shall follow them that believe, right? Them that believe. And so some scribe excised that from the text because he didn't like the idea. Notice what it says in Hebrews 4. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched. I thought, now what's that word touch? Let's get that word touched. Here's what it is. Sympatheo. There you go. See how easy that was? Sympatheo. Alright, so it's a verb. Eo. 
sympatheo, sympathos. Sympathy is the conjunction of two English words. Sympathy means, or sim, means a joining together, like a symphony. Phony, phonos is sound, okay? A symphony is the joining together of many musical instruments into one sound, all right? Sympathy means the joining together in pathos. Pathos is the soul of suffering, the heart poured out is joined together. In plainer words, whatever you feel, he feels. He feels it as strongly as you feel it. He feels it as deeply as you feel it. He feels it as personally as you feel it. That is our high priest. And he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And again, the English translators use two or three English words to translate one Greek word, feeling of our infirmities. See, the feeling of, they had, had to have that. That one Greek word, sympatheo, they knew exactly what they were talking about. It was the f joining together. Let's, now, let me ask you a question tonight. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to, you don't have to tell me personally. Have you ever really been touched by somebody else's suffering? Somebody else's marriage? Their trials, their, their sorrow, their hurt, their loss. See? The scripture says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of what? I've got to finish that one. Of Christ. The law of Christ. See? Have you? I don't always get touched like that. Confess tonight, I don't always. For some reason, I don't, but <coughs> sometimes I'm driven down to my knees with an overwhelming burden and feel what that person feels and enter into a intercessory prayer for them to carry them before God. Now, that'll do wonders for you. If you prayed like that for somebody else, you're praying for yourself while you're doing it. You understand that, don't you? It's this indirect application of things that Christians get that's remarkable. You're doing it for someone else, but you're doing it for yourself at the same time. Your motive is not selfish, but you will reap the benefit of it. There is no way that you can do something spiritual like that without it having an effect on you. That if you really did get into a situation where you were praying intercessory prayer, touched by the feeling of somebody's infirmities, that it couldn't have a good effect on you. And it will. But now what's, what, what, what does that produce? Well, it produces, it produces what he said it would produce. Healed. Saved. Delivered. Homes put back together again. Drug addicts delivered from their addiction. People set free. People whatever, whatever it is. I mean, look, listen. If I handed you a piece of paper tonight, one, if I gave you one sheet of paper tonight, you think that you could fill that one sheet of paper up with the problems going on with mankind? <laughs> I believe you could write a book on it, couldn't you? Yes. Certainly you could. But the truth of the matter is you can be overwhelmed with the problems. And that's why you have to find a place where you serve God. And you serve God in, 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 in light, understanding, knowing the will of God. Uh, folks mean well sometimes, but they get, uh, they, they get carried away sometimes. If you are called into a ministry of intercession, there no, there, there's none higher. Not in my book. No, no, no. If you're called into that ministry, you'll probably never see your name in, on a TBN. I doubt if they'll have you on TBN or any other religious. Because you're not looking for that. The truth of the matter is, when you get to the judgment seat of Christ, I think, and I honestly, I, fir I firmly believe this. I believe at the judgment seat of Christ, we'll find out what got the church through and what got it alone and, and what God blessed and what He used is far different from what we see. I really do. You know why? Because the nature of humility, it doesn't want to be seen. And the nature of humility gives power. Lord, it gives power. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, a humble man, a man or woman, who wants nothing, asks for nothing, but can feel the soul pain of somebody else to the point to where they get on their face before God and pour their soul out for them. 
One day we'll know at the judgment seat of Christ how many prayers were answered by people that you don't even know. Never met. No books were ever written about them. None of the great men of the past. There's nothing bad about the great men of the past. But friends, I got a library back here. I got one at home. I got one up here. I got three libraries. You can walk in there and I, I, can, give you, I can give you the standard names. We can call off all the names of the great evangelists and the great preachers and all of this. You know. And probably if you add them all up, you probably got a couple hundred, two or three hundred. All right, maybe three hundred, maybe four hundred. Let's just push the envelope and say a thousand. All right. How many of you believe we've had more than a thousand Christians in the last two thousand years? How many believe out of that uh, more than a thousand Christians we've had in the last two thousand years? Some of them never been heard about. But that may be why you're sitting in this building tonight. A grandma or a grandpa or a great-grandfather or a great-grandmother or somebody you never know. You, you don't even know in your family tree. Or it might have been the next-door neighbor of your grandfather. You don't know. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Amen. I don't see things usually the way other people do. That's a curse, I guess. But it may be a blessing too. It may be because I don't see it the way most people do, that God's able to show me something that uh, most people just overlook. How many of you believe in here tonight, how many of you believe, 2010, that Christianity, as you understand it, has perfected the doctrines of Christ and they understand God and we've got Him all wrapped up in an envelope and, and we can just teach you everything you need to know? So you think God's bigger than that? Have you in here tonight believe that the Almighty, if He did something 10,000 times, a million times, He could still do it a different way another time? He sure can. You'll never exhaust Him. You'll never wear Him out. You'll never fully understand Him. You'll never completely comprehend Him. And that's what makes Him God. Well, I want to tell you something right now. Your attitude is all important. When you enter into something, when you enter into a problem, Whatever the problem is, whatever, 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 when it comes your way, don't go into that with an attitude like, well, you know, huh, devil won this one. I've tried. It's not a matter of you trying. It's a matter of him being able to do above and beyond all that you ask or think. He goes beyond what you think. Think as hard as you can through a problem. You haven't thought hard enough. He can go beyond that. He's able to do it. And if He doesn't do it just now, overnight, just in the next few days, next few weeks, next few months, even next few years, what are you quitting for? I mean, what, why, why does prayers have to be answered just like that? I'm going to have a contest sometime. God answered my prayer in 24 hours. Well, I'll beat you. He answered mine in 18 hours. That kind of childish junk. You know what I mean? I see God answering prayers. I prayed a long time ago. I'm praying for prayers to be answered right now that I don't know when they'll be answered. But I know one thing. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to fold up. I'm not going to roll over and die. I'm not going to hand it to the devil. I'm going to continue on. I'm going to keep praying. I'm going to keep praying. And I'm going to keep praying. And when somebody asks me to pray for somebody to be healed, I'm going to pray for them to be healed. I'm going to pray for them to be healed. And I'm going to pray for them to be healed. Till the Spirit leaves that body and God calls them home. I'll stand right by their deathbed and pray for God to raise them up. Because He can do it. He can do it. And when all hope seems gone and it doesn't appear like God's anywhere to be found, He's there. He's there. And so to me, the Great Commission, Mark chapter number 16, just as good as Matthew 28. Don't you think? Maybe the problem's not in the Great Commission. Maybe the problem's in us. How many you believe that tonight? Maybe the problem's not in God and His ability and His greatness and what He can do. Maybe the problem is in our unbelief, which is so natural. You have to build faith, but you don't build unbelief. <laughs> You're born with it. All you've got to do is let yourself go, and you'll spiral downward. Christian, Christian. Let yourself go. 
let the conditions of the world, the assault of Satan, and just plain old the attrition of the body and life, just let it work you over and you'll go this way. Get your eyes back on the Lord tonight. And He'll lift you up. Father, in Thy name I pray. I gave them what You laid on my heart, Holy One. Lord, I can't perform miracles. I can't heal sick. I can't heal anybody. I can't do a thing to help anybody's family, their life, broken hearts, broken families, sin, bound in sin. God, I can't do anything to change that. I can't do a thing, Lord. But I can pray. And I can pray. And I can pray till I can pray. I'll pray till I can pray. Till I can pray more. Till the Spirit of God begins to take me. And take my prayers. And lift them higher than I could ever lift them. Lift them up into the presence, Holy One, where Thou abides. Father, tonight in Jesus' name, use these few words. There's somebody needed to hear this. There's somebody that needed to be encouraged. There's somebody tonight that needed simple instruction. That, Lord, you can be touched. You can be moved. You can be. You hear, you'll hear. You'll hear a heart. Not words. Not sounds. Not high-sounding talk. Not, not practiced words and practiced prayers and speeches. But, Father, you hear the beat of the heart. You hear the soul as it cries in real need. I know that. If I didn't believe that, I'd close this Bible and walk out that door. Why serve a God that can't hear you? But you hear, Lord. You hear. You've proven it to me time and again. You've lifted me up when I needed lifting. You've blessed me when I was down. You've given me strength when I was so weak. And I bless your holy name tonight for it, Lord. I'm giving you glory. Not this preacher. These people know I'm nothing. It's the Holy One. You're the one that makes all the difference in the world. And you can. And I give you glory tonight in Jesus' name. Bless the name of the Son of God. Hallelujah to His name. Amen. Bless the name. Bless the name.